एवरीवन गुड मॉर्निंग गुड आफ्टरनून गुड इवनिंग वेर एवर यू आर आई एम एसी से दिशा चौहान प्राउड फिन ट्रामा एंड योर फैकल्टी फॉर बिजनेस एंड टेक्नोलॉजी वेलकम वेलकम एवरी वन टू अ ब्रांड न्यू सेशन सो टूडे वी विल बी स्टार्टिंग ऑफ विद अ रिविजन बूट कैम्प Yes, my friends. Now that we have completed all our sessions, we will be starting off with the revision boot camp. Now you might ask, ma'am, what is this revision boot camp? So, revision boot camp stands on two pillars. Firstly, we will be starting off with the revision session, wherein all the sessions that we have completed that has been accumulated in sort of a summary, wherein all the important topics from all these sessions have been combined into one single revision session. so that just before the exam you don't have to go around and look at you know 10 videos other sessions you can just go through this revision sessions and you will be good to go the second part of a revision boot camp is the video question marathon yes after we complete a revision session our next sessions would be the video question marathon where we'll be solving the questions together we'll be doing section a mcqs and section b mtqs so that you know exactly what type of questions can come in the exam and you get a flavor of it so in today's session we will be kick starting with our revision so since all our sessions are completed you should be now going ahead and looking at this revision session wherein we'll be revising all of these sessions and all of the important areas you know that we covered in the various sessions so without wasting any time let's kick start with our revision session so what are we going to be covering in this session so firstly let's talk about our syllabus area so firstly in this uh, you know revision session we will be covering various civil uh, syllabus areas and we have divided this revision session in two parts so today we'll be doing the part 1 of revision session wherein we will see your business organization stakeholders you know we talked about the external environment wherein we covered the political factors legal factors economic factors we had also talked about the business organization structure what were the functions the governance we had talked about accounting and reporting systems how do companies have to comply with them what what was the you know the technology that they use security we also covered professional ethics in accounting and business we also covered how do these companies manage their teams or individuals we talked about leadership supervision and finally in the last syllabus area we had talked about personal effectiveness and communication wherein we talked about you know what are the types of communication we talked about time management in detail then we will also do an analysis of our past exam structure that how basically your exam will be you know which how many parts and all of that and i will share with you some exam techniques the best practices for now let's start with our revision so firstly we will talk about the business organization and their stakeholders what did we study here we firstly studied what is an organization which was basically that in an organization there will be a social arrangement for the controlled performance of your collective goals so as such in an organization you will have some goals right you could have a goal as such to increase or maximize your profit or it could be that you want to give something to the society you know if you are working for the society and profit could not be maybe your ultimate motive so whatever is your goal you in an organization you will have these collective goals and you will be controlling the performance of these employees who are working towards achieving these goals and all of these employees are in a social arrangement like you will have hierarchies and levels then we talked about the different types of organization so there were various types right we talked about commercial these organizations were wherein the profit was their objective so these were profit seeking org organizations the main objective the ultimate objective for these organization was to make profit here we covered a sole trader a partnership limited liability company so sole trader was owned by one and liability was on a one person you know the business and the person is not considered separate then we had partnership two or more people might come together and do business and we had limited liability companies wherein there were two types which we'll just see now 
Then another type of organization was NFP or your not for profit organizations as the name suggests they are existing primarily not to make profit for examples of these are your charities your schools or any NGO then in your public sector you had your government owned organizations or department those organizations which are controlled or owned by government you know there's police there's military so they will all fall under the category of public sector we had a cooperatives here this this is something which is owned and controlled by the members so people who have let's say same social needs or aspirations they'll come together they'll form this sort of an organization which is a cooperative and they will be mainly for the benefit of the members now let's talk about the limited liability companies wherein we discussed that there are two types so there was private limited companies and public limited companies the main difference here to notice your private limited companies are those companies whose shares are not listed on a stock exchange that is it is not available for the general public however for your public limited companies these shares are freely traded on a stock exchange you know it's available for your general public to buy and freely sell them another thing was that your private limited companies ends with ltd and public limited companies plc so this is something to keep in mind next we had talked about what are stakeholder wherein we studied that a stakeholder if you remember we had covered this that a stakeholder was an individual or a group basically who will have some sort of an interest in how the company is doing or if any activity of the companies they can be affected by it. so there were three categories here if you remember you know we had talked about our internal stakeholder these are internal to your organization you have your employees you have your management then we had also talked about our external stakeholders you know which are external to the organization as such do not have any contractual link you know you have your government you have your pressure groups all of them will fall under this category and we also had finally our connected stakeholders these are those stakeholders with which you will have sort of a you know connection contractual link so here you had your shareholders customers suppliers or your finances the people who are providing you money of course they are also interested in the working of your organization they have a contractual link with your organization so they become your con connected stakeholders moving on then these stakeholders if you remember we had mapped on the mendelos matrix wherein we have seen the level of interest and power wherein we had made a matrix so it depends if a stakeholder would have high level of interest and high level of power then that person is your key player your strategies need to be at least acceptable to them now this matrix can be used to track the changing influences and can be used to assess the likely impact of a strategy that can have on these various stakeholder groups all right next we had covered about organization structure now organization structure was basically wherein we learned different sorts of structure right we had seen so many types of structure and why do you have these structure so that you can easily divide and allocate work between your employees so you can have various sort of structure you know for example the first one is your entrepreneurial structure wherein you have you are the boss and you will have people working directly under you so each of these team members as you can see in this diagram you have your boss you have your team each of these team members will directly report to the boss they'll directly go and ask any doubts if they have if any issues are coming in directly to the boss there's no other person who will be going through you know passing the communication usually this is seen in a very small sort of organization which is just starting up then of course you have your functional structure now your functional structure as you can see in the diagram you will have your boss your you know managers whoever is there on the top and then you, different functions of your organization will be you know sort of divided in different departments you will have your marketing sales finance hr all of these different functions are divided in different departments hence uh, you know this is your functional departmental structure then we have a divisional structure wherein now you have your boss then you have divided it in different divisions right maybe you have two uh, or three types of products you sell soaps you sell maybe uh, even some biscuits and maybe one more item so you have divided divisions so one division soaps one division biscuit under these divisions now you will have similar functions which we saw on the functional structures so as you can see in this diagram you have your boss you have your different division and each division has their own function department so that was your divisional structure 
Then we also talked about matrix structure wherein this is sort of an amalgamation of your function and division. And here any person let's say who is sitting over here, let's say this person is A, he will be reporting to both a functional manager and a divisional manager. That is your matrix structure. This will be usually seen in a huge organization. Small organizations will pretty much not adopt this. Then we also talked about boundaryless structure. Now, it is an unstructured design that, that basically is not really constrained by any sort of a fixed form that, you know, th this will come under that. It's boundaryless. So here we talked about two types of organization. If you remember, we had discussed hollow organizations and virtual organizations. So hollow organization, what did they do? They split their functions into their core activities and non-core activities. Now, these non-core activities are something that they will probably outsource it. So, your core activities are strategically important and then you have your non-core activities. Your virtual organization will outsource most of their functions to any other third party or organization and only few they'll keep in-house. The best example for this is your internet retailer so what happens here you know the companies that you do online shopping with these platforms these are virtual organization they are not really set up somewhere it's not like you go to a supermarket and you can buy something right you need to go online and buy so these organization would usually outsource most of the function like there'll be a different organization doing their delivery maybe another organization is handling their customer calls and you know all of that so these are your virtual organizations so they it's not like they will only outsource their non-strategic or non-core activities they can outsource any of the functions then we have our Minsberg structure now Minsberg had believed that organizations can be analyzed into these five components and they basically relate how they will work and coordinate these five functions will coordinate with each other. So let's have a look at that. So here in this diagram, you can see you have your strategic apex. This is basically, you know, your top management who is there to make your strategic decisions. Then you have your middle line who will be passing down the instruction to your operating core, the people who are actually working and doing the work. You have your support staff, this is your PR or any legal counsel services and then of course you have your techno structure, you know your finance, HR, all of them will fall into this part. Next we will talk about the scalar chain. Now what is scalar chain? This is basically a line of communication sort of which is followed. This is the line of authority which can be traced up or down the chain of command basically from your most senior member to your most junior member. So if let's say I'm a staff and I want to maybe communicate to my manager, then I'll probably have to go through a chain, right? I'll go to my supervisor, he'll go to my AM and then probably the manager. So that is known as your scalar chain. It refers uh, to the number of levels of management within an organization. So let's say if I'm a staff here and this is the manager, so there will be so many levels that I probably have to go through in order to communicate to that person. So that is your scalar chain. Then next you have your span of control. It is the number of people for whom one manager is basically responsible, directly responsible. So here, let's say I'm a manager, I might have five people under me. And on the contrary, another department is a manager, he might have 10 people under him, right? So his span of control is more because he has more people under him. Then we had also talked about tall and flat organization if you remember wherein we said the tall organization since they are taller of course they will have a longer scalar chain but the span of control here is narrow that is one manager will be relatively responsible for fewer number of people maybe two three right narrow span of control and of course we had a flat organization of the scalar chain here is reduced but the uh, sp wider span of control so you can see here in the diagram this is a tall organization so basically too many levels so of course your scalar chain is longer but one person is let's say responsible only for two people or three people so a narrow uh, span of control how in a flat organization you will see that the levels are pretty much reduced right only let's say two levels so it's a smaller scalar chain but the span of control is wider one people is managing so many people as compared to your tall organization so this is a uh, sort of a difference uh, and distinguishing feature between these two types of organizations next 
centralization and decentralization what did we study here that centralization is basically your authority uh, to make any decision sort of will lie with your upper level uh, upper level of management that is with your senior management however in a decentralized organization this authority to make any decision is passed down to the units and people who are at the lower levels you know people at even the operational level can do so they can make decisions that will be known as decentralization benefit is of course if you decentralize then your you know senior management can just only focus on the main strategic things and overall whole picture and they don't have to you know sort of see the day to day problems that are arising now levels of planning within the organization so here we had studied the anthony's triangle anthony's hierarchy whatever you want to call it so there were three levels of planning we had on the top your strategic level here these people you know your strategic managers your top level managers are going to undertake your long term planning this will be affecting your entire whole organization and they will be making any fundamental decisions then you have your middle level that is your tactical here you will be making decisions regarding various regions or divisions and finally you have your operational level here you make your day to day decisions you know functional decisions and these are very short term they are not really going to affect the entire organization just a particular probably function so you are making in this your short term day to day decisions in this uh, you know level of planning if you do at your operational level this was your anthony's hierarchy or triangle next another topic that we will be covering now is marketing so marketing if you remember we had already covered we had studied in the session that there were four p's of marketing and marketing basically involves any activity when you're sort of promoting the products of your organizations or any service that your organization provide so that of course people are aware of it they go ahead and buy they make purchases so marketing refers to activities that a company will undertake to promote the buying or selling of any product or service so you could be advertising it you could be just you know de uh, delivering the product to consumer other businesses everything is fall under your marketing category so four p's that we had covered were product price place and promotion important to remember these four p's of course and you know under all these four p's there are various things which we'll be seeing now also uh, you could get mcqs from here you know that which p is they which p they are talking about so let's say if they say that you know uh, there's a company and they are now going online they will just be selling online so what p will be probably effective so of course place right maybe they have stores they are shutting them down so now they are changing their place of business so they ca you can get questions from uh, like that so it's important to sort of differentiate between these four p's that how one is different from the other first one is your product this will consist of three elements you have your core product you have your actual product and then you have your augmented product then in price if you remember we had covered four c's what were these four c's firstly the cost you will see what was the cost and accordingly you will price your own goods the customers how much are the customers actually willing to pay your competitors you know what are they pricing what are what level they are selling at because if i go higher than that then why will anyone buy my product and of course what are your corporate objectives is it to make profit to lower cost whatever is that accordingly of course you will make pricing decisions then there were various pricing strategies all of these we covered in detail in our sessions there was cost plus pri uh, pricing strategy wherein you're just basically adding a markup so if let's say cost of uh, you know making this pen is five dollars and if i just want to make one dollar profit so i'll sell it at six dollars then there was penetration pricing perceived quality pricing price discrimination wherein you're charging different customers different prices or in different markets there was your growing rate pricing price skimming loss leaders wherein you're willing to sell one product at a loss because you know you will recover it from your next product and you have your captive product pricing two products you will probably sell you will be selling together uh, or they are need to be used together you know like once people buy a coffee machine then they have to keep on buying the you know the coffee capsules also so 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 sort of they are in a position that you can't just do with one product so they these were the various strategies and uh, which we covered under your pricing then of course there was promotion wherein we said that the aim is to basically move towards your ada 
sequence which was basically action interest desire and awareness so that was your ada sequence then place two main choices which you will consider as such whether you want to sell it directly to your customers or you will sell indirectly that is there will be some intermediaries wholesalers retailers and place will also relate to any issues regarding your physical location maybe how people can buy from where right whether i go to a supermarket or i go online and how are you distributing or what are your logistics how will this product reach your customers all that will be covered under your place then we also talked about the strategic marketing process basically strategic analysis of firm choice and implementation you will basically see your budget what is the budget for your marketing and how can you sort of create an awareness you will do a you know uh, analysis of the market as such what do customers really want so all that falls under your strategic marketing process next we'll be talking about organizational culture in business so as handy said organization culture is basically the way we do things around here so any organization personality is going to depend on various factors what were those factors you know the values the attitudes the beliefs that people have the assumptions that are there the expectations the norms the whatever the routines are going on the rituals the symbols all of these can impact the personality of your organization so what are the factors which could influence an organization culture you know the size will depend the technology what type of technology you use how diverse is your organization do you have people from various you know parts of the world or you are just you know um, recruit people from only one particular you know country nationality religion so of course then you are not so diverse probably then your culture will also be different as opposed to a diverse organization age group people who are in you know, organizations wherein you have people who are of younger age probably their culture is going to be completely different from those organization wherein you have people uh, who are of a higher age right so maybe you have more stricter rules there history and what has been the type of ownership so now your link between your leadership and organization culture was something which was given by sheen so link between your leadership and culture was told by sheen wherein he said that the original leaders of our organization are going to be you know sort of forming the culture and future leaders will be appointed if only they agree to that culture so there were three levels of this culture that leaders must appreciate you have your artifacts these can be seen your spouse value and your basic assumptions these cannot be really seen as such then the link between your structure and organization culture was something that was given by handy wherein he had categorized in four cultural types you know there was your power culture uh, usually associated with your entrepreneurial structure basically one person is going to have all of the power and is going to exert the power you have your role culture you have your uh, you know sort of different functions you have your task culture and you have your person culture you know specialization people uh, you know maybe a law firm or wherein people are all specialized or accountants group of accountants you know open a firm so they will have a person culture there so that was given by your handy then of course another uh, theory which which was given by hofstede now he said that your national culture can have a huge impact on your organization culture and he talked about four things power distance how willing are your employees that someone exerts power so maybe they are a high pd or low pd uncertainty avoidance how much are they okay with you know new things happening with some uncertainty going on or maybe they have really not okay with it that you know they just want to do the fixed thing they don't want to really explore individualism versus collectivism there will be few people who will prefer always to work individually who there will be few who will always want to work in a group you know and they will you know always keep the group interest higher than their own individual interest and finally your masculinity versus femininity so in a masculine culture you will be able to sort of encourage or motivate your employees by giving them a better salary hike or some status job status or a higher designation or promotion but if it's a feminine culture then probably they are looking for a work life balance and some relationships at work you know social relationships 
So that was all covered by Hofstede. Then we had talked about informal organization, which was basically a network of relationship, which will exist somewhat in almost all formal organization. And this is not something that the management has created. It happens over time when you meet people, new people in the firm, you become friends and then hence you form an informal organization. Next, we will be covering your IT and information systems in business. So in this session, if you remember, we had talked about in detail about what is data, what is information and, you know, various sorts of information systems that can be used by business. So let's start by understanding what is data. So if you remember, what did we say that data is unorganized raw facts that will need processing if you want to, you know, make some sense out of it. So as such on its own, you can't really use data after you process it. Only then you'll be able to make sense out of it. Now, information is the data now which has been processed. So once you process your uh, data, it becomes information. Something that is now meaningful for you to make decisions. Data processing will turn data into information. So, And we are also covered the differences between our data and information. We cover what are the qualities of good information which was basically accurate. This was a mnemonic. So from A, it's accurate, then complete, cost effective, understandable, relevant, adaptable, timely, easy to use. So these were all the qualities of good information that it needs to be accurate and complete. Incomplete information, not really very useful. Cost effective, the cost of, you know, getting that information should not be uh, more than the benefit you are at, at the end of the day getting from it. Understandable or user friendly, not have too many jargons, relevant of course for whatever work you need, it needs to be adaptable, should be able to change timely, should be able to get a time on time and it should be easy to use as such. So these are all the qualities of a good information and the mnemonic here that you should uh, you know keep in mind is accurate. So uh, from accurate you can get, uh, you know guess all the other words. Then we had talked about what is a system. So a system is a collection of all the procedures and processes. It can be manual or it can be also an automatic system. So there are some advantages if you have an automated system. What are these? That of course your speed is going to be higher. Something that you were doing manually, of course, if you do with, with the help of a computer, it's going to be really fast. It's going to be more accurate. The chances of, you know, committing a mistake will be less because human error will be less volume you can process so much more data in a computer rather than doing it manually and of course there will be elimination of human error because your computer will be able to catch if you maybe do some mistake you will get a probably a pop-up then we had talked about the it system wherein we cover that there are variety of it systems that can be used to sort of provide information within an organization so you have your executive information system on also EIS, they are basically going to be helping your strategic decision making your top level. Then you have your MIS or management information system. They are going to be converting your data from internal sources into information to aid the managers make the decisions. Then we have your DSS that is your decision support system. Now they will support any sort of semi or unstructured decision making. We have our expert system captures the human expertise in any particular area. So if any particular area you want some, you know, expertise, you will probably use an expert system. And of course, you have your TPS or transaction processing software, wherein you are here performing your basic day to day routine transaction. You probably are recording the transaction if in a system that will be a TPS software. Next, we will talk about spreadsheets and database. So we covered this in our session. What did we learn here? That spreadsheets, you know, your excels that you use. Again, you can put in a lot of data. You can sort of use so many formulas. You can filter out data. You can use pivots. So they are widely used by finance professionals. They are, of course, very simple to use. A little bit of training, you know, a few formulas you need to learn and you are good to go. It is widely recognized. Many people, most of the professionals all around the world use these and they are more appropriate for your short term analysis rather than your long term storage. However, what is a database and how is it sort of uh, different? Now, for large volumes of data, a database will be preferred to a spreadsheet. So, a database is a collection of structured data which can then be manipulated. Its advantage is that, of course, there will be, uh, you know, avoidance of any duplication or repetition of your data. 
one single source of data it is better security you know than your excel of course there is greater flexibility and it is very consistent drawbacks there is data security data privacy it is more complex you will have to it's not that easy to learn or operate and it is definitely far more costlier next we move on to external analysis wherein we firstly talked about our political and legal factors so in our political and legal factors we said that organization will need to co uh, consider various things you know that the legislation what are the regulation any sort of political issues that are going on now they, this can be impacted as such at three levels that is you have it could be either be globally that is your supra national organization it could happen at a national level or it could be happening at a very local level now next is your protecting of employees which is basically your health and safety at work so this part we talked about that what are the something that organization will need to do to ensure that the employees that are working in the organization they are working in good healthy and safe working conditions so the national government have passed these legislation and the employers must provide safe entrance and access to their employees they need to provide a safe working environment you know as such whatever uh, you know if let's say you're working in a factory everything you know there should be good exit entry point fire exit um, you know people should be well aware of the layout and it should be safe working condition so that you know accidents don't happen safe processes safe equipment if you know as a company that you know this equipment is faulty you should go ahead and change it or replace it because an employee could use it and it could lead to an accident you need to give appropriate training and also investigate if there were any injuries or accidents that were happening at the workplace these are some of the responsibilities that employers have towards their employees for maintaining a good uh, working and safe condition employees also need to do some things that they need to consider their own safety at work and also the people who are around them so make sure whatever you're doing it will not affect you know some other person in a harmful way comply with the all the guidelines and of course listen to the trainings carefully this is a legal issue which employers must take very seriously so this is not something that employers will take very lightly because people can employees can go ahead and in the future sue also next is your data and security uh, data protection and data security basically protecting your confidentiality so data protection was basically you will uh, organization of course hold a lot of information about the customers employees and it is their responsibility that they need to protect all of these individuals data against the use misuse like someone hacks is or misuses their information what were the principles of data protection um, that this personal data should be acquired and processed lawfully so if i am acquiring any data of an employee that i should be acquiring it lawfully that person has given me consent that yes i can use all of their details this data should not be used for any purposes which are incompatible from the original purpose so if i took this data for a particular purpose then i should be only using it for that purpose and not for anything else that will be considered illegal data should be uh, relevant for the purpose of processing it should not be accessible only take that much of amount of information that you actually need and not excessive information it should be accurate and you need to keep it up to date it should not be kept for longer than required if an employee leaves an organization and let's say it's been 5 years since that person has left why you still hold the data you should clear that data organization should make every effort to protect these data from any unlawful processing or someone stealing this data or destroying it what is data security basically how you can keep this data safe from any corruption or unauthorized access so there are various sort of risk to your data security you have your physical risk you have your you know human damage operational problems and of course there's data corruption next we'll talk about consumer protection so these laws were designed in order to ensure that there is fair trade going on and you know this good competition free flow of truthful information so your sale of good acts basically talks about that the seller must have a legal title or ownership of that item that they are selling so if i am selling this pen then i should be the owner the legal title is should be held with me it's not that it's my friend's pen and then i'm going ahead and selling it 
the goods must be of satisfactory quality and fit for the intent purpose whatever quality uh, you're selling it should be of good and that uh, you know should be able to use the properly when a buyer makes a purchase based on a description then the good must be corresponding to that description if you say let's say a particular product you're sending that 9 grams of sugar is there in it uh, 2% fats are there then make sure that that is the correct information because the person might be buying according to the description next external analysis and economic factors so here what we what did we do firstly we had talked about the macroeconomics wherein we saw that macroeconomics is basically you see the economy as a whole and then we had talked about microeconomics wherein you see the individuals as such so again we'll be revising in the same way first we'll be revising our macroeconomics so macroeconomics is concerned with the total aggregate scenario of your economic issues now macroeconomic policies there are various that you know economic growth low inflation low unemployment and a balance of payment balance of payment is basically you're recording all your financial transactions that you make between your individuals your firms your businesses your government with any foreign consume foreign consumers and organization then we had talked about monetary policy and fiscal policy so what was the main you know sort of a difference here with monetary policy you aim as such the government aims to impact the supply of money in the economy and hence it is going to affect the spending so that how the government can do that by interest rate by foreign exchange and you have your fiscal policy here uh, the gov uh, it relates to the level of government spending borrowing and the taxation which is used to manage the economy so you have your government spending and you have tax your direct taxes or your indirect taxes this is how the uh, government can sort of uh, manipulate and you know see how the economy is doing by using taxation also you could lower the level of taxes or you could increase that next is your trade cycle this was the sort of a fluctuations that have in the economic activity so if you remember we had covered the trade cycle it looks something like this all right so you, this is your good period boom then you have your bust you have your recession then you'll again start going up so this will be your recovery and that, so on and so forth and this keeps on going you know economic fluctuations keeps on happening so that is a trade cycle now these cycle will alternate between periods of relatively rapid growth periods of stagnation and decline and we also talked about that it is not necessary that all products have a trade cycles few products might always be doing good then there were various types of un un unemployment that we covered and again it's sort of a good thing that if you can uh, you know uh, sort of remember all these various types and remember what they are talking about because you could again get a mcq from here that maybe one person is facing this type of or an economy is facing this type of unemployment what is this type of unemployment so it's a good thing to remember this so you have your real wage unemployment which will be caused when the supply of labor is excess but um, excess exceeds your demand but real wages are not falling maybe you have your unions and they are not letting the uh, you know wages falling as such even though the supply is more than the demand and technically they should fall you have your frictional unemployment usually difficulty in matching quickly workers with job when you are changing jobs that period you know that will be your frictional unemployment you have your seasonal unemployment sort of depending upon you know a particular season like if let's say you sell uh, woolen clothes then obviously during summers you will be not be employed structural unemployment occurs during long term change in any conditions your technical uh, technological unemployment sort of a part of structural when any new technology has arisen or you have your cyclical or demand deficient unemployment which will match your economic climate trend as boom decline recession so once there is a decline or recession probably more people will be unemployed so there will be cyclical unemployment then we had covered the economic theories here we covered three theories if you remember Firstly, we talked about the classical theory who said as such government do not need to intervene. They said, you know, on its own, the demand and supply will come together on an equilibrium point and as such, the government does not have to do anything. So they said the government does nothing and the classical economists believe that economically will naturally move to an equilibrium with full employment on its own. But of course, Great Depression happened and then this theory did prove itself to be 
sort of useless and then you had your Keynesian view or the demand side which was given by Keynes. He argued that government will need to manipulate the level of aggregate demand that is the demand side of economics in order to reach that equilibrium point. Then we had our monetarist view which was your supply side. Here monetarists again return to that view that as such go, uh, you know equilibrium will happen and they, you, basically there are some imperfections. So that imperfection is something that government will have to see. So they have said that the point where supply will equal to demand all markets in the economy the only reason that this does not happen is because of the imperfections that are there in your economy as such. Next, we talk about microeconomics. So, we covered macroeconomics. Now, we will be talking about microeconomics. Now, these looks at individual people and firms within the economy as opposed to, of course, your macroeconomics. So, here we talked about demand of goods and services wherein we said, firstly, the demand curve is always a downward sloping curve. So, this is your demand curve. It's a downward sloping curve as opposed to of course your supply curve which is always a upward sloping curve. Now, demand how will that be effective? It will be of course the price of your product. So, if your price is increasing then the demand will probably decrease. That's what they say and that's why you have a downward sloping curve, right? Then you have your price of other products. Let's say other people, your competitors are selling at a cheaper price then again your demand will probably fall. The consumer's income, if they have more income, they will probably spend more, demand will again increase. Sociological factors, taste, all of these are somewhat going to affect the demand. How will supply be affected? Again, what is the price of your product? If you are selling at a higher price and then of course you want to supply more so that you, know, you can make more profit. Uh, what are the factors of production, the goals and the technology that you have? Supply is basically what producing firms are willing to supply. They will normally supply more for a higher price and hence that's why for this sole reason the supply curve is actually upward sloping and your demand is downward sloping. Now equilibrium, what was equilibrium? Equilibrium will be the point wherein basically there is an intersection, your demand and supply curve intersect. So this is your demand curve, this is your supply curve, this is E equilibrium point. This is the point wherein your demand is absolutely equal and matches to your supply. This will be the most efficient uh, point of price because supply will exactly be matched to your demand. Then we had talked about price elasticity of demand. This was basically uh, a measure, you know, extent of change in demand that will happen when you compare it to a change in price. Then you have your coefficient of PD, the formula was basically percentage change of uh, change in quantity demanded by percentage change in price and that by doing that you can find out what was the coefficient of PD that is your price elasticity of demand. You have your income elasticity, percentage change in quantity demanded by percentage change in income now instead of price. And you have your cross elasticity of demand wherein percentage change in uh, quantity demanded of good A divide by percentage change in price of good B. So, this is between two goods. Here, this is a, you know, table that I would suggest you keep in mind. You remember it because again, you can get a MCQ from here that, you know, it could be like the cross elasticity is, let's say, minus one. So, what are the, you know, what are the types of goods there that they are? They, are they complements? Are they perfect complements? So, it's good uh, practice to sort of keep this in mind that if it's minus one, they are perfect complements, negative complements, zero unrelated, positive substitute and if it's plus one, that is they are perfect substitute for each other. Then we talked about perfect competition. He, this is basically categorized that there will be many buyers and sellers and they are somewhat selling similar product that is substitute. That is you could be selling you know butter and margarine. They are substitute. You could be selling tea, coffee. Then you have your imperfect competition. This is wherein one firm or few firms will have too much control over your market and therefore they can go ahead and you know charge anything because there are not many people you know more competition. You have your monopolistic competition, this type of market will have many different competitors but again somewhat differentiated pro products that is best example restaurants, right. 
there are so many restaurants but some of them all of them are selling, selling their differentiated product we have italian restaurants indian restaurant fast food restaurant they are all restaurants but they are all selling differentiated products so that is your monopolistic competition and then of course you have your oligopolies again another form of imperfect market wherein there is just few firms usually it's said two to six and if it's just two it's called a duopoly all right moving on to the next part of external analysis which is your social your environmental and your technological factors and the various competitive forces that are there in your as such environment so here firstly we'll talk about the socio cultural factors now these will of course vary from various country to country because every country will have you know sort of a different uh, people diversity and hence this is something that will going to be different so some factors that you will consider her is religion language what is the distribution of wealth and population distribution then you have your social structure which is basically related to the concept of social class which is nothing but that it refers to a group of people who will have sort of same social or educational status right so they will probably be grouped together in a social class so if we are all we let's say we've done particular sort of similar degrees of our same background then we are in a different social class as opposed to someone who is probably not that educated then you have your technological factors technology will has led to an increase in the following there's downsizing that is as such uh, you know you are uh, probably removing uh, maybe closing down an operation or department as such there is delaying that is you're reducing the layers of your management and there's outsourcing that you are sort of uh sending the work whatever there is or a department to a third party or a country or in a, another country as such you have outsourced that function what are the environmental factors you have your sustainability that basically means that organizations should use resources in such a way that they are not compromising on the needs of future generations so if you are using if your company who uses a lot of paper then make sure that you are even planting trees because then of course your future generations will not have enough trees or paper uh, you know timber to make paper from corporate social responsibility is basically it refers to the practices and policies which are undertaken by now these organizations or corporations basically to have sort of a positive impact or positive influence on the world or the society as such next is your competition so you know the competitive forces you could use the swot analysis this we if you remember i had explained with the help of an example of coca cola that what were the it will do a swot analysis what are the strengths weaknesses sort of the opportunities and threats for that company Porter's five forces here your competitors are also part of the environment and will require some analysis this can be done by using your five forces what were these five forces basically you will see how attractive is that industry you will see the threat of new entrants can new people come into this industry what is the bargaining power of buyers suppliers is there a threat of substitute are there too many substitute and there is rivalry and competition within the industry this will of course be influenced by your barriers to exist exit porter stated that a firm who is wishing to obtain any competitive advantage can have these three options that is cost leadership strategy that is what you make sure that you are whatever cost you are incurring let's say to produce a product you are the lowest in that so then of course if i let's say let's do with an example all right firm a um, um we all are let's say manufacturing a pen it takes for firm a the cost to manufacture it uh, let's say 3 dollars for firm b it takes 4 dollars so here what down this company can do either firm a can sell it at 4 dollars so their profit will be 1 dollars or they can sell it at 5 dollars right uh, because firm b is already selling at 5 dollars in order to make a profit so if they sell at 5 dollars they are making a profit of 2 dollars so by you know being a a uh, cost leader that is producing at a very low cost they can of course make more profit or they could sell like i said at 4 dollars and make increase their sales you have your differentiation strategy and you have your focus strategy this can be of two type cost of differentiation that is you will maybe uh, you are focusing on the cost uh, cost leader or you are differentiated that is you will sort of say that all right i will only cater to the needs of kids i'll sell goods only for this particular section so that is a differentiation 
Porter's value chain we had talked about the primary activities what were inbound logistic whatever is coming in now you know your materials that are coming in you have your operations you are converting these raw materials into a final product you have your outbound logistic they are now going from your warehouses to various distribution channels you have your marketing and service after sale service probably whatever you're providing they are also sort of uh, you have your support activities in your value chain you have your technology you have your human resource management you know relating to the recruitment of people procurement and of course in general the infrastructure or layout of the organization all right next we move on to talking about ethics in accounting and business now this is also an important topic so here what did we see ethics is basically a system of moral principles which will examine the concept of what is right and what is wrong so here we talked about various approaches to ethics and various theories so in broad we covered various theories and also there's one more term which which you could get you know um, in apart from these terms there is uh, teleological uh, these are those people who will again say that again it depends on the consequences right the consequentialist approach where that is this approach says that a decision is right or wrong depending on the consequence so they are also known as teleological and you have your dentological they are those who will say no some things are right and some things are wrong so which we had of course covered in our absolutism so they are sort of dentological so that that is another term to keep in mind so here this approach your conciliatory approach can be broken into two parts all right you have your egoism they will see that an action will be either morally correct or wrong as long as the outcome whatever they are getting if that is favorable for that individual who is making the decision but in a utilitarianism they will see how they it is going to be affecting maximum number of people right is it favorable for greater number of people so they are not just going to consider the individual self you have a pluralist approach here basically you are trying to cater the needs of all stakeholders without seriously compromising interest of any particular one group so you know if you are making a decision you will see how you know you can cater the needs of a stakeholder so how did we uh, talk about this we i had discussed if you remember an example wherein i said that you know uh, if an organization is opening a new factory so they'll consider all the stakeholders the people around there their own employees everyone and they'll see how they can you know sort of cater to the needs of everyone so that is a pluralist approach there was relativism that they said there's no as such universal moral code which can lead to those actions and you will do probably uh, depending on the situation you have your absolutism or uh, as i just now mentioned or your dentological that is this approach will to ethics will argue that certain actions are inherently right or wrong they'll say that killing a person will be absolutely wrong even though it was done for self defense so it is good to remember these terms and what they are talking about next acca code of ethics so your international federation of accountants that is ifac has given a code of uh, you know provided a code that is objectivity professional behavior you need to have professional competence integrity and confidentiality so objectivity free from bias professional behavior obviously if you're working somewhere you know you make sure you do a professional behavior you're talking properly respecting your clients professional competence you have that enough technical knowledge whatever you're telling your client you know that you're sure about it integrity honest in your dealings and of course confidentiality do not go ahead and you know just um, whatever people uh, the clients data is you are just uh, spreading it or uh, you know you are not keeping it confidential there are various ethical threats you have a self interest threat wherein you do you could do something wrong because it will benefit you too self review threat wherein you are reviewing your work yourself then of course this threat will arise advocacy when you are sort of promoting the you know this usually happen in legal cases with clients uh, when you sort of promoting their opinion familiarity threat if you know your client too well then of course this threat will arise an intimidation threat you know, probably your manager is asking you to you know do something wrong they said if you don't do it you will lose your job so these are the various ethical threats and dilemmas and if these arise as so you should either report to your you know if you have your and your officer ethical officer to them or your board of directors or your audit committee or you can also uh, you know go to your professional body for any advice or a legal advice 
Next is your corporate governance and social responsibility. So corporate governance is basically the concept, basically how the organizations will be directed and controlled. It is the combination of various rules that you will have, policies, processes, laws, by which these businesses are operated, regulated or controlled. What are the principles of corporate governance? So five principles that the right of shareholders. You should treat all your shareholders equitably, that is equally. Shareholder, stakeholder relations, it's not just your shareholders who are important, there are other stakeholders also. Disclosure and transparency and the responsibility of the board. Then we had talked about the agency concept. So, what did we cover in this? So, here we said, this refers to that organization owners basically who are your shareholders, they will be the principal and those who manage the company, they are the directors who act as the agents, right? They are working for these principals or the shareholders. Stewardship theory was basically that your management act as stewards of the asset. They will obviously decide, right, how it's going to be used. And in the ways, of course, that should be consistent with the overall strategy of your organization. You have your agency theory, which basically says that rather than acting as the steward of the company, here management is seeking their own interests. Then you have your stakeholder theory that believes that management will have a duty of care, not just to their owners, that is the shareholders, but also to the other stakeholders, the wider community. We talked about the various talk stakeholders just now in the, you know, the first part of the revision. Then we have a non-executive directors who are not employees of the company as such, but they do take part in decision makings at board meetings. They do not take part into the day-to-day -day running. They are just seeing that overall how are executive directors doing, you know, doing the function of acting as good stewards. What are the overall strategy, how they can challenge it and that's all. Not really participating in day-to-day -day running. What is the role of your non-executive uh, directors? It is strategy. They will contribute to the overall strategy. Performance, they will check and scrutinize your you know, executive directors, how they are performing, are they able to meet the goals or not? Risk, that is, they should uh, satisfy themselves that all the financial information that is there is accurate, you have good controls in place. And people, of course, they will be responsible for determining what is the salary or remuneration packages for your executive directors and even appointment and removal of those directors. Then we talked about the various committees that we have, right? wherein we talked about the remuneration committee. So a remuneration committee is a committee which will be made up of non-executive director. Now they are responsible for setting up the remuneration or various incentives or salary or wages of your executive directors. Because obviously executive directors can't themselves set out their wages, right? Then you have your audit committee. They consist of again your independent non-executive directors who will be responsible for monitoring and reviewing what are the company's internal controls, how good they are working. So your internal order will be probably reporting to this committee. Then you have your nomination committee. A nomination committee should be in place for selecting board members and they will be recommending to the board that all right, let's appoint this person. You have your risk committee. Uh, if you have it, great. Otherwise, the work of risk committee is done by audit committee. This will ensure that systems are in place to identify and assess and manage any sort of financial risk, monitor the financial risk. Corporate social responsibility is based on the idea that you need to be sensitive to the needs of even the other stakeholders and not just your shareholders. So it is your responsibility as an organization that you are focused on even the other stakeholders and not just that, all right, I'm working only for my shareholders. Next, the role of accounting. So if you remember in this session, we had talked so much in detail about Basically, what was accounting, the various, you know, sort of processes that we have and all of that. So, the accounting function will play an important role within an organization. This includes, you will be establishing your procedures, implementing your financial procedures. And finally, you are going to be monitoring your performance. Now, the regulatory system, so there are various factors that can be advised. You know, you have your company law, we have your accounting concepts, standards, European Union, and you have your other uh, international influences, and of course, GAP, that is your generally accepted accounting practice. So, they all form a part of your regulatory system. Now, in the UK, 
the companies act will require that the financial statements to be true and fair and there are some requirements that is you need to follow accounting standards you need to follow the generally accepted whatever generally accepted best practices there you need to make sure that you have information that is of sufficient quality and quantity and that it is free from any material misstatement happening then we had talked about financial system wherein we said a system is a collection of procedures and processes and system can be manual as well as computerized so you have your purchasing system this was an important area to control because you are now purchasing raw materials or items and you will have to go through some you know sort of authorization right so buying you will probably need an authorization that this limit only some person has to authorize it you will be recording it which will come under accounting and of course good inverse that is who will keep them safely custody you have your sales system that you're selling now goods are going outwards and you have to make sure that you're recording that entries properly and whatever money that you're getting recording that also properly cash system any payments to the bank from the bank you know receipts from customer payments to customer and your petty cash petty cash is a good practice to you know do a bank reconciliation probably every month so that you know that it is also at the correct level payroll now you could have various inputs to your payroll system you have your clock cards you know the time sheets that employees fill and amount of bonuses what are the outputs you get you get your pay slips right you get your payroll analysis any sort of uh, uh, you know information that you get for your tax purposes all of that will form a part of your outputs purpose of organization controls why do we have why do we need to have these controls because you want to safeguard your assets if i didn't have these controls employees then will freely roam around uh, steal my inventory do whatever they want to to make sure there is efficiency to prevent again any of this sort of fraud from happening and to prevent any error from happening sometimes it could be that they are doing it unintentionally but you of course want to prevent that from happening too then we talked about automated systems now your automated systems are basically um, something which most of your organizations nowadays use nowadays very few or small absolutely small organizations would be probably using manual system even they will have at least one computer to work on most of the work now it's automated why because what are the features there is uniform processing of transactions you can you know put all the data and uniformly it will be processed there is lack of segregation of function but there is of course that this data can be corrupted easily and there is a need for increase management supervision now because of this automation all right next up is control security audit so in this session we had covered if you remember we talked about what are internal controls why do we need them what is internal audit external audit their differences and so much more now so let's quickly revise that so what is an internal control any action which will be undertaken management to ensure that the goals and objective as such of their organization can be achieved so the purpose of internal control is again that there is a reliability of financial reporting that whatever you are showing the data you are saying that yes it is fine it will be reliable because you have controls in place effectiveness and efficiency of your operation will be complying with your laws you will be safeguarding of course your assets and you will be able to prevent and detect fraud so if you have good controls in place you can prevent any fraud from happening or if it has happened you can at least detect it that all right this went wrong so this internal control framework what all does it include it includes your environment you know the control environment as such it includes your risk assessment and response processes your information systems your control activities and monitoring of controls now there are various types of controls that we had covered right we had talked about administrative and accounting controls we had talked about prevent detect and correct controls so prevent controls of course they are there to prevent any fraud from happening basically you will probably tell right that you need to authorize amounts above this so that you know you prevent fraud from happening then you'll have detective controls probably you'll do a bank reconciliation because if something goes wrong if something was done wrong you will be able to then detect it you have correct controls to co correct of course whatever wrong is happening you have a discretionary and non discretionary control non discretionary something which will be there in the system as such you can't really change it and application and mandated controls 
then internal control is within an organization is important why because of course it will improve your efficiency and effectiveness if you have good internal controls in place the chances of fraud and error are happening will be low and of course as an organization your efficiency will improve it is of course good for corporate governance it is definitely for many countries a legal requirement and of course it can have, you know prevent fraud from happening in the very first place what is internal auditing so internal auditing these are people who are employees of your organization or you can even outsource this function to a third party this is done by the independent appraisal of the effectiveness of your organization operations and management basically how you know properly are your whatever you know internal controls you have they are working fine or not the policies that you have are they enough or not all of that is something that internal auditor is going to be looking at What is external auditing? A periodic examination of the accounting records which will be conducted now by an independent third party. So this these people are not your employees. You are not outsource it to anyone to do the work like internal work. This is an independent third party who will provide sort of a you know opinion whether or not your statements are giving a true and fair view or not. So what are the various types of audit we have? We have our operational audit. Now these are concerned with any sphere of your company activities as such and they are you know generally um, you will be doing this to concentrate on the outputs of your system and the efficiency of the organization as such then we have our systems audit now this is based on you are testing and evaluating your internal controls that you already have all right in your organization so that's why you have your systems audit you are basically seeing right that how is it going you are testing you're evaluating that the controls that you have in place can you rely on them or not and under your system audits wherein you're basically evaluating your internal controls you have two types of tests right you have your compliance test wherein you are seeking evidence that the internal controls are being applied as prescribed. So as the auditors, internal auditors prescribe that these have to be used this way, are they actually being used that way or not? So that's your compliance test and your substantive test is you will substantiate the entries in the figures in account. So whatever value if it's coming, let's say for cash if I say $100 million, then you'll see is this 100 million actually correct do i have that evidence for that that is your substantive testing basically here you can discover any error or omission what is an audit trail basically a record showing who access the computer system what changes did they make so you know it will come all right this date this uh, time the shard did fixed assets then this did this time this person did cash so you know who is doing what and if somebody else is doing other person open somebody else's work why did they open you can ask them maybe to do any fraud so that is that it will maintain a sort of a record also it will recover any lost transactions so it is useful for maintaining your security and recovering your lost transactions so that is your audit trail then you have your it system security you have your physical threats right there could be a fire there could be a flooding going on lightning and all of that can sort of impact uh, your uh, you know all the data Next is your cyber attack, which is basically here someone is trying to gain an unauthorized access to your, let's say, network or computer systems to cause any damage. You have your cyber security, how you can protect, you know, from any of these risks from happening. So there are various types of cyber attacks, right? We have our phishing. Here what happens, the fraudulent practice, you will get an email that will be shown that it is from that reputable organization and you might give out some information so let's say if i get an email from a bank let's say i get an email from citibank and i have an account with citibank and they say that all right we need these, these, these details you know and i think that oh it's coming from my bank and i tell all the details but actually it's from a you know party who's trying to get these details to misuse maybe they want to do some fraud you know take my money so that will be known as phishing 
you have farming it is a form of cyber attack that is going to send you to a fake website that looks like the original one so maybe i have on google i type city bank and i clicked on a link and it or web page was open so i think this is actually the web page of my bank i start doing you know putting my id password but actually that was a fake website i was redirected to that so that is your farming you have your hacking so hacking what happens here in hacking you there's an attempt that you will exploit a computer system somebody if i use i'm using my laptop let's say i have all my personal data photos information somebody hacks my system or somebody can hack your you know a social media account some you know you hear so many times that twitter is hacked or someone's facebook is hacked so people gain unauthorized access to their account and then they can misuse it right they can post anything from their account we have a webcam manager what happens here here your cyber attacker will use your web software any software to take control of the user's webcam so you have your webcams either on your laptop so you have an external webcam a person can hack that and then they can control that probably so with this what we have done we covered this part your internal security and you know audit so with this we finished the first leg of our revision session now the remaining sessions the whatever is left we will be again revising them in a second session or revision so we covered so many session this was your first revision uh, revision part 1 now we will be covering many more uh, topics that are left in the part 2 of the session so i will see you now in the revision session part 2 till then this is disha chauhan signing off